Good morning, Mr. Shuler. I guess I guess I highly understand that you guys have to do this. It should be done on the pipe. I guess it should be done. Can I do it? Shall I hand it to Mr. Shachin? I guess we need to do it all. I guess we need to hear the father to tell us. It's not long to a night that you should teach us all the kinds of things and care. So don't expect anything. It's coming to us. First of all, I'd like to say that it's genuinely a privilege to come back here to Glenties. I appreciate, uh, Joe, that the uh, congregation gathered here this evening did pay a, a, a minute's well-deserved uh, silence in recognition of the contributions of the late Brian Lenehan and the late Dr. Gareth Fitzgerald. Uh, both of them were here, as you point out. I also know today that uh, Cadell Evans won the Tour de France. And as you know, the President and me are... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I was asked the question in Brussels, like, was the Gaelic spat over, I said, c'est fini? <laughs> and uh, that's my story about the Tour de France, because uh, when I was Minister for Tourism in 1994-97, one of the things we did do was to lay the foundations for the Tour de France to come to Ireland, because the Tour and the Directeur Sportif, um, Jean-Marie Leblanc, did I say that properly? Uh, used to say we'd like to start the tour in a different country every second year uh, and Ireland should take up this opportunity but of course as an island we had to hire two of the largest ferries in the world to get the <laughs> entourages from Ireland back to Roscoff anyway the thing worked out very well a thousand uh, journalists turned up internationally in Dublin Castle we had signed the agreement cost us um, quite a deal of money but uh, in any event um, Jean-Marie said, I, I'm going to speak in English. And I said, well, in that case, I will speak en français. Um, and uh, before we went out to uh, speak to the assembled uh, sporting might of the world, I said to him, there's a problem. He said, what is the problem? I said, the, the government have just realized that um, the Tour de France is to come to Ireland almost to the date of the 200th anniversary of the landing by Le General Humbert in Kilala to drive out the Brits <laughs> and said they want to start the race in Kilala <laughs> and he said to me who is this Kilala? <laughs> so it's my privilege to be here on this uh, occasion on the 11th series of the John Hume inaugural um, commencement of the McGill School. And John Hume is a man whom I've admired for very many years, along with many others um, of, your, of your party uh, and the part that you played as one person uh, in putting together the pieces of the jigsaw uh, of the fragile peace and democracy that you've built over the years and which we now enjoy. And those of us in public life who have a responsibility to see that that continues I'm always struck by one of the iconic images of John Hume. It's um, not where he goes up on the stage in Oslo to accept the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, and it's not when he's telling stories to uh, President Clinton in the White House. My picture of Hume, actually, is a black and white photograph of a young man with dark hair in a dark suit leaning against a wall on a summer's day. But he's not leaning against the wall in the usual sense. Nor is his hair dark in the usual sense. Nor his suit. Because the young man in the picture is uh, spread eagle against that wall by a British soldier, having been arrested after the demonstrations at Le Burnham Road. The suit and the hair are dark because as a civil rights leader he'd just been water cannoned by the British Army. That was the 26th of August 1971. 26th of August 1971. And 40 years on the peace that he helped create a piece which, as the poet said, comes dropping slow, 
is still fragile. And those of us who are involved in this know that as a consequence, it's even more precious. I suppose there's a certain satisfaction in saying that for a full generation of uh, northern men, the most striking aspect of that black and white picture is not political, not even sectarian. It is, as they would say, sartorial, because the young man in the picture is wearing socks with sandals. <laughs> so Ireland, in many ways, can never imagine or appreciate the repayment that it owes to John Hume. And for that reason, I'm honoured to be here this evening to give this inaugural lecture, the 11th series of the commencement of McGill. Just shows you how the island has transformed. He's wearing shoes and socks tonight. <laughs> I think following what the ambassador has said here, this demonstrates the change that's occurred. You've got a new executive, a new assembly, a new government, a new era, a new political age, and that's reflected by the almost instantaneous reaction of the British government in reducing the level of the interest charges on their bilateral loan to Ireland and the point made by the Chancellor when he, um, when he, uh, when he spoke as a consequence. Patrick McGill might well have wondered about the uh, accrual and the repayment of moral debt when it came to the First World War where he fought with the London Irish Rifles. And as it happens on this very day, in 1927, the Menin Gate Memorial was opened at Ypres and it was inscribed with the names of the missing. Tonight and every night, just a short while ago, six French volunteers stood there to play the traditional salute to the fallen warrior. The last post, seeking out the names of the dead and the missing, scattered, as they say, in the braille of war, not alone over the gate itself, but in all the international theatres of war, in the hearts of the families that these men would never know. Families who now make pilgrimages to Europe from every part of their world in honour of their dead. And I commend former Deputy Paddy Hart, former Minister of State, for his work in putting the Peace Tower in Messine, which was the first connection between our President, Mary McAleese, and Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, which resulted <laughs> which resulted in that connection being fostered and developed and nurtured to a point where for the first time in a hundred years a reigning British monarch came to this Republic of Ireland um, to reflect on experiences of the past and to demonstrate the forging of new platforms for the future. Well done, Paddy Hart. <laughs> and, uh, Patrick McGill collected the songs of the soldiers uh, noting how his friend and rifleman Bill Teeks said, These here songs are no good in England. They have too much guts in them. And guts are another kind, of another kind, are what we need now, both as a European country and as a European Union. Because if there is one good reminder why we should work to keep our union, to preserve our peace, to cherish our European community. It is that memorial at Menin, or those at Messine, or Bomo Habe Hamel, or wherever. Because our European Union has brought us what has been called one of the most sustained eras of peace on our continent, 
and you're living through that. A union all the more remarkably because it came so soon after the possibility that there might be no Europe at all post Second World War. I was asked this question by a young man in Leaving Cert in a Dublin school some time ago. He said, why should there be a, a European Union? And I had come across the uh, story of Harry Patch some time before. Harry Patch lived to be the oldest member of the infantry of the British Army. And at the Somme, going from one field to another, he came out upon a man who had been shot by shrapnel. His uh, insides were on the ground, and the man said, shoot me. And Harry Patch described afterwards how he drew his revolver and was with him for the last 90 seconds of his life. And he said, he uttered one word, just one word. And he said, it haunted me for 88 years. He said, it's the most precious word in the English language. And that word is a mother. And that's the reason why we should have a European Union, never to have young men or young women involved in that kind of activity where it can be humanly prevented. Um, and all the developments that have taken place and all the potential, uh, human, social, political, economic and everything else, is all there because they gave their lives and fought in so many theatres for what they believed in. We have a chance never to allow that to happen again. And for us here in Ireland and in Glenties, we can play our part in that. I don't know whether any of you know what it's like, actually, to be the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach. <laughs> walk into the room of the 17 leaders, or walk into the room of the 27 leaders, and make your case for your country. Anybody who follows me in this job, I'd advise them not to drink too much water before they go to those, because if you go out, if you go out, you might be down a few billion by the time you get back. <laughs> I see Pat Cox here, he knows a little bit about this, because from his experience he would have seen these people floating through the pictures of uh, politics in Europe. But I want to say to you that um, I was very happy with the, with the outcome of the uh, Eurozone meeting this week. Because I'll tell you why. There was a palpable sense among those leaders uh, from our colleague countries uh, that here is an example of a government and a people facing up to a series of unprecedented challenges in this country and to make our way in meeting the conditions and the circumstances that applied to the IMF EU loan facility to Ireland. But I did say to them, you know, actually Portugal is not in long enough to have to have an assessment carried out yet by the Troika. We've had three now. So I reminded leaders in thanking them for their cooperation and indeed their patience uh, that the assessment by the Troika is a bit like being stopped by the police on the road, you're glad to know that your papers are in order, but you're not quite sure until they're handed back to you. And that's the way you are. We're not actually in charge of our economic destiny uh, in the way that we would like to be. And in order to get back to that point and to, to, to pass that signpost on the road, we've got to meet a number of challenges and obstacles that lie up ahead. But because the case being made by Ireland and by other countries was that the European circumstances now required a European response, not just as an individual country. Um, that we, we have always said that the cost of the, of the fund was too high, that it needed greater flexibility, and that interest rates should be reduced. And that's what's happened this week. And I think the message in there for markets for the future is that clearly written into the conclusions of this particular Eurozone summit the fact that, um, is the fact that um, financing will be guaranteed for the future once the country measures up to the conditions and the circumstances of its particular, of its particular, um, of its particular loan facility. From that point of view, I have to say that other leaders and other countries now see Ireland 
as being one country that is prepared to make decisive decisions uh, about what it is that we have to do in the interest of our people and our country. And I reminded the ministers around the cabinet table that they have two fundamental responsibilities. The first is to find solutions and the second is to make decisions. And that's what we've had to do with banks. And that's what we have to do with a whole lot of other things and a full range coming up for the future. Because the mandate given to me was not to leave things as they, are, as they were, not to sit back and hope that some, uh, somebody will pass by in a ship and say we're going to sort all your problems out. The only ones who can sort it out are ourselves. And I'm a great believer, actually, in Irish people having the pragmatism and the innate experience of being challenged through adversity of one sort or another and being able to measure up to those challenges, whatever they might be. And this is not a situation where we've been struck by a tsunami like those poor people in Japan, not where we've been struck by an earthquake like the people in, in, in New Zealand, or where pestilence and plague can storm the land like Somalia caused by wars of one description or another aided by natural causes. This is a, an economic challenge that we face. And coming as, as we do to Glenties this evening, being an integral part of a county that has seen emigration for many centuries, we know how to meet and indeed how to beat economic challenges. Um, and for that reason, let me tell you quite bluntly uh, that we're not going to use the um, downsizing of the debt burden on us from, la from this week uh, to soften the difficulty that we face with our budget at the end of the year. You know that any shop in this town, any household in the country that's spending more than it's taking in is going to get into trouble very quickly. And our country is uh, spending 18 to 20 billion more than it's taking in. And that can't continue and that won't continue. And that means that what we have to do now is to sit down and analyse how the taxpayer's money is actually spent in what we call a comprehensive spending analysis across all departments. The end of that process will be in September. And that will leave us with a clear view as to what programmes have to be shafted, what programmes have to be maintained, and what programmes have to be increased. We'll tell the people that so that they will know. They can plan uh, in advance uh, for what it is that we're going to have to do. So I'd like to think that the mandate given to me is going to be reflected in that reality. And we will, as we, as we um, perceive the scale and depth of the challenge to be, tell the people that and say, this is our plan. This is what we intend to do. And I'm an optimist by nature. And I like to think that, you know, in the next 18 months to two years, we get back to a point again where we borrow on the international markets, obviously, um, and be in charge of our own economic destiny where we want to be. So I hope that, the, um, I hope that, the, that those who are leaving, and they are leaving, will um, keep those links alive with our country with all the modern methods that we have now, so that the acquired experience that they gain in other countries um, will be able to reinforce our own country when we give them the opportunity to come back. Not nice to see people having to leave. I was in Dublin airport recently going over to uh, London and a young man and a young woman there were leaving for uh, Australia. He was an accountant. Um, she had, she had um, a qualification in some element of commerce and irrespective of how sophisticated technology is, tears are tears. And they didn't want to leave, but young people will not hang around if there's action somewhere else. Um, so our job is sort this out, sort it out, so that people can then decide how best they want to live their lives. If they want to live and rear their families and have jobs and careers in this country, we give them that choice. And if they want to do something else, that at least we give them the competence and the confidence to stand on any other stage around the world with their peers and measure up as, uh, as I know we do. Um, so. As somebody who's, um, who's concerned about the welfare and the future of, of all our children, I, I hope uh, that they will return or will want to return to a country which deep inside us all is our home. And that we build a prosperity not measured just in, in euros or in cents, 
but in, a, in the value of self-worth and the value of community. And I see this all over our land, be it in urban, town or country. Um, the value and the commitment of so many people to seeing that their communities are strengthened, are nurtured, are developed, and that whether they be elderly or vulnerable or um, are challenged, disabled or whatever, that the community spirit drawing on the various elements of state can build those communities to be strong, that people have a sense of pride in their place and in their homeland. So I want to assure the McGill School here that, um, that the government that I lead will do everything possible to see that the, um, that the circumstances in this country will want and will be such that people will want to come home. We're calling them together again in October in Dublin Castle and uh, this time we expect to have a really strong follow through on a number of serious initiatives to tie in our diaspora in a global sense. I had the privilege of being in Washington and New York, met two and a half thousand Irish American and American business people who are excited and enthusiastic about wanting to invest in the country here. And that pipeline is very strong. They're equally excited about the continuing growth in small companies from Ireland, exporting and employing people in the United States. Irish firms now employ over 80,000 Americans in 40 states, and we want to see that continued and built on. And uh, I think Julian mentioned the McElroy victory, and um, Clark, and McGrain, and McDowell, and Harrington, and you know, my call is come to the home of champions and we should be after our American colleagues who are, after all, the most liberal with the dollars when they come and play the golf courses of Ireland. This is a remarkable record for a small island to produce five major winners in the last number of years. That's quite incredible. I hope that um, Rory's run of luck continues because I'm going to play with him in the Pro-Am on Wednesday in Killarney. <laughs> and uh, not too sure after the draw this evening that Mayo are playing Cork next weekend. In any, in any event, um, I don't want to see a country that's sort of divided into columns of uh, profit and loss and based on stats about euros and cents. We have a, a moral duty and a political duty to do everything humanly possible as a government to see that people can get back to work and have the opportunity to do that. Because work, as you know, is not just about money. It's about our sense of self. It's about our sense of self-respect. And it's about human dignity. I've often said on the run into the last general election that by 2016, five years hence, I want to see a situation where this is the best small country in the world in which to do business, the best small country in the world in which to raise a family, and be the best small country in the world to grow old with a sense of dignity and respect. These things are all achievable. These things are about ourselves. These things are central to the kind of government and that I leave for the next number of years. And part of that, I suppose, is um, within the constraints and circumstances of the IMF EU uh, loan situation, we've tried within those limits to put together a jobs initiative to press start our own uh, indigenous economy here. We have by far the highest savings ratio in Europe. Um, I was in Waterford recently at the launch of the tall ships. 500,000 people came there. I was in Killarney the same weekend at the big cycle, um, cycle for charity, the regatta for cancer, and the Munster final. You couldn't get a bed within 15 miles of the place. Um, I came up there this evening. I hadn't anything to sustain my, uh, my appetite uh, all down into the, um, the Yates Tavern there in Drumcliff. Saw no sign of recession there, 300 people, and they seemed to be enjoying themselves, and I said, fair use to them. Even in the middle of recession, it's good to have a day out of enjoyment, and on a day like today, who wouldn't but, um, but find some, uh, some strength in that. So I want you to know that in the coming months, between September and Christmas, I think probably will be one of the most hectic uh, doll sessions uh, in living memory. Because we are going to have a, we're going to have 
one hell of a roller coaster here. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to face into a number of very difficult areas. And they're all going to emerge now under the, um, under the comprehensive spending review. We've got to make decisions then about the 2012 budget. And that means bilaterals between myself and the ministers. It means the Minister for Finance got to look at the bigger picture. We have our duties and obligations in the European context, both with the core responsibility of the Parliament and the Council. We've got to start preparing for the presidency in the first half of 2013, when a number of very big decisions are going to be made during the Irish presidency. We've got to presidential election in the middle of all that and the uh, budget in, in early in December. This is going to be, going to be um, reflective of a very different kind of doyle where the rules have been changed. There will be far greater freedom of expression for uh, deputies on all sides to get involved in issues that they might have an interest in and also to give them uh, the opportunity uh, to bring in legislation that they might think should be worthy themselves by special sittings on Fridays where private members' bills can be brought forward by any backbencher, be they government or be they opposition. Um, and that's why, instead of sort of tinkering around with the edges here and reducing VAT by 1%, actually what government decided was to have a real impact in the hospitality sector, including for Donegal, by reduction to 9% of the VAT rate, halving of the, 50, of the uh, PRSI for employers by 50%, focused on that sector, all the hotels, the golf courses, the hospitality, the coffee shops, the hairdressing, the newspapers and all of these things. I would say here in this county, of which half of me belongs, I'm not even sure which is the right one or the left, but that anybody who doesn't play the game is letting down their country. Uh, and for those who, um, who are involved in the hospitality sector, make sure you tell all those people that you are passing on those savings which are backed by government as a direct impetus here. I'd point out that down in Killarney when I was there, all of the hoteliers came together, all of them, and they said that in their town, in their locality, the savings were of the order of, um, of 10 million, which would be passed on to consumers, give them a quality experience when they go to that town or any place else in the island of Ireland, so that when they leave and they're stuck at the traffic jam on Brooklyn Bridge, that they could say, wouldn't it be great to be back in Glenties? <laughs> That's the trick. We want to fill 20,000 places in education for training and work experience for job seekers. They're not full-time permanent jobs, but they get people out of the rush of so-called having nothing to do to get into that kind of work. We want to reform the JLC system. As you're aware, the court struck down the process that had been in place for many years because when that legislation was drafted originally, there wasn't actually any policy position to drive those functions and with the result that it became very tedious and very confusing and once the judge uttered those words everything relevant to that became unconstitutional we've got to change that they want to see also in the autumn the introduction of a partial loan guarantee scheme for a small business because one thing that comes across to us all is the fact that while banks have had big decisions made about them two pillar banks that we're still not getting evidence of credit uh, being lent and being made available to business to the scale that it, that it required. Now, I'd be the first to say that not all business should get, uh, should get loans from banks. Uh, some are in a position where they shouldn't. But obviously, there's a serious demand out there now among people to want to get back into a position of employing, of changing direction, of exporting again, of growing our own economy, which is what we have got to do. If the debt burden is on one side, get the growth up on the other, that's going to be really good, that's going to be really good for, uh, for, for us here. But always remember that in the 1990s, for instance, it took nearly a decade of strong economic growth after the recession before the numbers who were dependent upon uh, weekly welfare payments actually began to fall significantly. We don't want to fall into that trap again. We've got to really drive on with this. You have a situation where you have 450,000 on the live register but 300,000 unemployed. There's got to be some analysis of what's happening in there uh, and there's some serious uh, adjustments to be made. So we can't allow a situation where all that talent uh, and uh, effort is going to waste. Let me tell you, I was out in, in Microsoft uh, uh, 14 years ago. They employ 1,500 people here in Ireland. All of them are young people. All of them are creating the future. All of them are excited and enthusiastic about the future as they see it. The average rate is about 75,000 for people who join in there. A lot of young people don't know when they fill their CAO forms that that sector is one that, bears, that, that has enormous potential. They would reckon that the cloud computing 
industry, which is the warehousing where your st uh, content uh, data is stored, will be worth about 40 billion by 2014. And we in Ireland should be able to take measure of 10 to 13 percent of that with serious potential for employment. The same applies in the gaming industry, the same applies when you see the the consequence of the, um, of the serious investment by Intel, for instance, in, the, in their 500 million euro expansion at Leakslip. Or when you go down to uh, Hewlett Packard, and look at the very large sign inside the door that says, Thinkers are great, but doers change the world. I would like to think that this government is a government of, uh, of doers. Um, and in that sense, um, my, one of my jobs really is to see to it that ministers keep their nose to the grindstone, but at the same time that they reflect upon what it is that they're actually doing in their departments. Because as I reminded them, the public service is great in the comfort zone. New minister comes in, new minister is welcome, doing a great job, big office, here you go, here's your portfolio, here's your program for government. Following day the roof opens, you say, all the stuff that's been over 25 years lands on that desk, you ring the wife or husband, as the case might be, say, we're going to be very busy. I'm going to have to go to America. I have to go to England four times, to Britain, I don't know how much, to Brussels another six times. I might even have to go to Australia. And you look back in six months and say, what did I do, actually? So it's about priorities and not taxing employment and not taxing work and giving um, impetus to potential and to open these doors. And I would say here in Glenties, as I've said at every meeting around the country, if somebody in this room is involved in business, if you show me where the red tape is blocking you, if you show me where the administrative block-up is, I want to hear it. Because I discussed this with the British Prime Minister. And when both of us had the privilege of speaking down at 8 o'clock in the morning in Diageo, I didn't participate, but the Prime Minister did for some strange reason anyway, um, in the black stuff, uh, the thing was that um, we both said, look, if you're in business and you want to make headway, but if, it's, if, it's, if it's possible for government to ease that journey so that further employment and further opportunity can be created in accordance with the rules, we'd be very happy to do that. So I want to see a situation where we will, we will determine by decision of cabinet what it is that we've got to do uh, in the time ahead. So that means, as Ambassador has pointed out here, you know, restoring confidence, dealing with our balance of payments, getting a, a, a situation where we're, going to put, where we're going to put employment and opportunity right up there at the front line. I mean, I can confirm to you tonight that there are discussions now going on um, about investment in one of our banks. I can't, I can't say what the outcome will be, um, but the opportunity is there for for serious momentum by investment, um, by investment uh, in one of those banks at the moment. I'd also make the point here that you know, when the government was appointed, one of the things that we looked at was the portfolio of assets that Anglo hold in America. They're valued at about 11 billion. And people said, you know, this is going to take 10 years to sort out. I had this problem with elements of the public service with respect to them. You bring in outside expertise, real real red-hot expertise. The consequence of that decision uh, made by M Michael Noonan was that in 10 weeks the entire portfolio of those assets has been offered on the American market with a, with a range of serious interest from companies with a lot of liquidity uh, in the US which when it's concluded will again give a demonstration of momentum and confidence and movement uh, in our country, which I think is, is, um, is really very important. And we're going to do the same following on from the banks and directorships and managerial and all that sort of stuff. Um, obviously, bank lending terms have to, have to remain fair. They sim banks you know, can't simply blame the private sector for not making loan applications or refusing ones where the conditions are so tough that you couldn't take it down in the first place. Um, so. In that sense, there are two sides to every coin and get that balance right is what we have to do. Also, the tender is out at the moment for the um, situation where we're going to have available um, microfinance for startups for small business, Glenties, Dunlow, Adraha, Donegal, Larrakenny, wherever you want. Opportunities where people see I could take on two or three or five people and get on with the business. I have to tell you, I was at the IFA function the other night in the Shelburne Hotel. And they had a hundred of the best producers of food in Ireland there. Absolutely outstanding quality. Outstanding. You would be so proud of the people from all the different counties who do such work in this area. And as, as I've often discussed with, um, with Pat, the potential for food 
uh, and Ireland's reputation being enhanced is so strong now because food security is one of the really big issues within the European Union. And you only need to see what's happened, God forgive me, in, over in Somalia where you see the pictures of your television screens when you can understand we've got real potential here. This creates problems for us, if you like, and says we've signed on for certain carbon reductions. If you're going to increase your potential in agriculture, you're dealing in a directly contradictory fashion with what you signed on for quite a number of years ago in terms of reduction of emissions and carbon footprint. And that's a matter for discussion uh, and politics, uh, given where we are uh, and, the, uh, and the reputation that we have. So we've dealt with a number of uh, these issues. Um, Joe, in the sense of changing the rules of the Dáil, that's phase one. Uh, phase two will follow. You know, we now have longer sitting times. And there's more opportunity for deputies, front and back bench, to do their business. But I'm, I have to say that I'm, 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 I'm pleased because um, Ambassador King and I have had quite a number of discussions. He is the first British ambassador ever to have climbed Croke Patrick. I can tell you, as he got within 200 metres of the top, oh, for Christianity, says he. <laughs> and just as a little aside, when we came down on Saturday evening, I won't tell the full story, Julian, don't worry. Um, it, the, uh, there's a beautiful car park there with the community centre. And as it happened, my friend the priest was about to say Mass at the door of the community centre. People were in the car park. And it started to rain. And I said, Julian... You see that scene there now? Well, 200 years ago, they used to be out over the back of the mountain because the people with the red coats might be coming and the priest would be saying, I can't say mass for you anymore. <laughs> so he's certainly one ambassador who understands exactly what the situation is. and He's proving the point by, uh, by doing a superb job when Her Majesty came here on her visit in Fairfield. <laughs> so... Um, I made a few remarks this week about um, children, which means uh, a lot to me, I have to say. And I just wanted people to understand that when I say we live in a republic with laws and responsibilities and rights, I mean it. And um, the fact that I've had thousands of, um, thousands of messages from around the world speaks for itself about the impact of the way people feel, not just to mention that, but the, the numbers of um, members of the clergy who have been in touch in the last few days has uh, astounded me to say it's, um, it's about time somebody uh, spoke out about these matters um, in a situation like you are. And um, I haven't made any other comment except to say that we await the response uh, from the Vatican. So I like to think that uh, part of what we do in government is to create the environment where the innocence uh, of children can develop naturally uh, through their formative years and that when they grow up and grow old, they will look back with a sense of pride and a sense of respect for where they came from. Um, so in that sense, um, I know that there are people out there suffering with mortgages in distress, with their families gone away with uh, a seemingly endless disillusionment about employment. I look at the other side and I say, you know, the place to be to make an impact on these things is in government. It is so easy, so easy to be in government if you think you can give out the checks that are based on the perception of permanent wealth, which is only an illusion built on sand. It's a hell of a different prospect. Um, when you say, I've got to lead this, and lead it we will. So I'm going to conclude by saying to you that I am a, I'm a very strong optimist about the pragmatism of our people in what we have to do. I'm going to leave here after a short while I go to Dublin, because I've got to attend at the swearing-in of the new Supreme Court Justice Susan Denham tomorrow morning. That's a signal and a statement of intent uh, by the government of the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court being a woman who's an outstanding judge. I'm sure we'll do a wonderful job for him.
So I'll leave you with those few thoughts that this is the ultimate political challenge. The first big tower block up ahead, the first big roadblock that's been there for a while now is to get to a point where we can legitimately wave goodbye to AJ and the ECB and say we're back in charge again ourselves, at which stage we'll have whittled down uh, all of the waste, hopefully, uh, and be much more efficient in the way we do our business. But also to look with absolute optimism at where our country is now headed. Because we can beat this economic challenge, and we will beat it. And what I want everybody to understand is that they all have a contribution to make. Everybody. I'm going to lead that by example. Now, in accepting the Nobel Peace Prize, John Hume uh, quoted Yeats, and he said that too much suffering can make a stone of the heart. Think about that. Too much suffering can make a stone of the heart. And too much negativity can take the, the heart and the joy out of a nation. I'm not going to go around for the remainder of my term in government with my hands, my head down in my hands, wringing disillusionment that we cannot do anything about this. Of course we can, and of course we will. Signs are there this week of the strength and the reinvigoration of the Irish people, recognised by all our colleagues in Europe, and backed by our friends uh, in the British government and the Chancellery, by firm evidence and action of what they have actually done. So, in Glenties, at this the 11th John Hume uh, lecture, the start of this particular brilliant week, I have no takers here, Joe, I'm going to take down all the good points for me. For the sake of our country, and for the sake of everybody else, we've got to look up in front and look forward and look to that mountaintop because I know we're going to get there. This is our message. This is my ambition. This is, if you like, our intention for the nation as we proceed and march towards the centenary of the, um, of the first dates when uh, those men and women who rebelled and rose and fought and died uh, for independence and economic sovereignty. So, how could I put it better than by saying, this is our country's call? I intend to answer that call by example of leadership. And I ask every one of you to join the government, to join our country and our people as we take off the jackets, roll up the sleeves and get down to work and prove the point that they didn't die in vain. Thank you very much.